We're at the Gurdwara Sri Guru Singh Sabha in Southall, the main flagship Gurdwara in the Punjabi community. And today we're going to go upstairs, and we're going to bow our heads, um, we're going to um, give some money to charity, and then we're going to sit and absorb the sounds and the look and the feel of the place so that you can document in your own way um, and make some work from that. After that we'll be uh, having some prashad, which is uh, a blessing, and then we'll be having langar, which is uh, a vegetarian lunch freely served to everybody. I've got pictures of my parents getting married in 1967. My parents' wedding was one of the first weddings to ever take place in this temple before it was rebuilt in 1985. The holy book is sat under the covering at the back. There's always somebody 24 hours reading from the holy book. Most of the temple is run on donations. And then you've got the guys on the side that are singing. This, the music they're making is called Kirtan. So that's, that's, that's what it is. And they have separate verses from the actual holy book for separate occasions. So now we're at point of interest number two, which is the brilliant restaurant. This family run restaurant uh, is by a family that uh, are twice migrant Sikhs. So they went from India to Nairobi in Kenya and then migrated to here. So this award winning restaurant serving North Indian Punjabi food, family run and voted as one of Ramsey's best for Channel 4. The owner, Bishan Das Anand, opened the first brilliant restaurant in Kenya in the 1950s, catering for up to 10,000 people at a time. Point of interest is because they catered for my wedding, so we used them. Um, and the East African community is really, everyone knows everyone, so business-wise, you'll do business with the same people, building, you know, anything you need within the community. They tend to stay within the community. Not only was Das a master of his trade, but he was known to many as being the master chef and was frequently cooking for the Maharajas and chief ministers in Kenya. Das passed away in 70, 1970 and his family continued a legacy of the brilliant. In 1973, due to political pressure in Africa, the Anand family moved to the UK and whilst in the UK, two of Bishan's sons, Kiwal and Gulu, Anand decided to carry on the tradition and opened this restaurant. It's always been here since 1975. So on numerous occasions, a brilliant management team have been asked to open branches in various parts of London and also abroad. Although it felt the brilliant would be extremely successful if, if they'd done that, but they didn't do that for one simple reason. If customers want to come to the brilliant, they should travel the distance and come to this place in Southall. After brilliant success on Channel 4's Ramsey's Best Restaurant series, where the restaurant was voted as one of Ramsey's best and after being visited by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, the popularity of Brilliant has increased um, and the daughter and her brother that now run it, Dipna Anand, she's recently opened a bar and restaurant at Somerset House. So that's, so they have finally spread out. And this is a North Punjabi Indian cuisine. 
So it's, uh, it's traditional, but it's got the influence of East African spices and herbs. Okay, so we're going back to the main road now. Okay. This is the Dominion Centre and Library. The original building no longer exists. So it became a cultural community centre. It was taken over by Mecca in 1962 to host bingo nights during the week, wrestling on Saturdays and then hired out to the Indian Association of Workers to put on films on Sundays. The earliest cinema to have shown Indian films on a Sunday. So this started showing films in about 1956, something like that. It was as early as that. But it only showed them at the weekends. And I think there was complaints about the Indian Association workers but you're hiring it out to us and we're the ones that we, we started putting the films on in the first place. So there was a bit of you know, politics there as well in terms of charging the Indians to watch Indian films. Southall is known uh, as Little India, obvious reasons really. And I wanted to let you know as well that um, Southall is also home to a feminist organisation called Southall Black Sisters, which was founded in 1979. So Southall Black Sisters was set up to help vulnerable women from ethnic minority groups who have no source of income or access to financial support. These women are often asylum seekers or migrants, having temporary spousal visas who have been subjugated to violence and domestic slavery. SBS funds these victims of abuse through churches, temples, mosques and gurdwaras. However, the payback is that these conservative religious organisations have strong values when it comes to women and the family. So in 2008, Ealing Council decided to withdraw all funding for SBS on the grounds that specialist services for black and minority women worked against the interests of equality, diversity and cohesion. In fact, the council decided the name Southall Black Sisters was unlawful under the Race Relations Act 1976 because the council said it excluded white women. And therefore, the organisation was seen as discrimin discriminatory and divisive. In court, SBS argued that the council's one-size-fits-all rule approach was misconstrued because it ignored unequal structural relations based on class, gender and race. SBS argued need for a specialist services for minority women due to language difficulties and cultural and religious pressures. That was their argument they put forward in court. So SBS stated a need for guidance from a democratic, non-religious ethos in complex circumstances where racism and religious fundamentalism are on the rise in the UK and worldwide. SBS won their case in court and received further funding. Another reason the residents of Southall were so against the National Front was that their ideology had led to the murder of an 18-year-old, Gurdeep Singh Chagar, who was stabbed to death three years earlier on the 4th of June 1976. The engineering student had been killed by a racist gang while on his way to the cinema. The Southall Youth Movement was formed after the incident to challenge the rise in attacks by members of the National Front and to give the community a voice. The set second lot of riots was in 1981. The Asian community harboured resentment toward the police, believing that Peach's death had not been adequately investigated. When right-wing neo-Nazis planned a concert at the Hamburg Tavern in Southall in July 1981, the scene was set for conflict to occur. The skinheads who converged on the district passed out flyers to the local residents and displayed white supremacy paraphernalia. This provoked the youths in this largely Pakistani population to respond by burning down the tavern. This act touched off several days of confrontations between the Asian youths and the police. And then the final most recent riots was in 2011. I don't know if you remember between the 6th and the 11th of August in 2011. There were riots around the country um, and Southall also had riots here. So in that instance, more than 700 Sikhs living in Southall turned out to defend their temples and homes against the threat of possible rioters. The defiant group of men, some in their 80s, took to the streets to keep trouble at bay following reports that an attack was planned on the West London town. Each of the Sikh temples was protected by around 200 men, some armed with swords and hockey sticks, while others stood guard over their homes and businesses. At London's largest Sikh temple in Havelock Road, the temple we visited, elders called in reinforcements to help, after only a handful of police were seen patrolling the area. There's also been some exhibitions on Southall and the story of Southall, 
most recent being the Southall Story exhibition. And that was exhibited at the British Library in 2009, the Southbank Centre in 2010 and the Dominion Centre in 2011. You remember we visited the Dominion Centre when we stood outside and I pointed out the building? The Southall Story celebrated this vibrant British suburb and aimed to create a broader awareness of its diversity and global cultural significance. So that's all the information I've got for you. And then we're going to head down to the Broadway, the main shopping centre for Southall. Okay. So in terms of my practice and the materials that I use to create my artworks, which are normally installations, you can see my Instagram account to see what my work looks like. And then you'll get an understanding of why I buy my materials from here. So I've purchased things like these, which are prundies. So they're like Indian hair extensions, and I've used those in my work. These are wedding bangles for a bride. Her uncle, her maternal uncle, would be the one that puts them on her. Uh, it was part of the ceremony leading up to the marriage. These can be really ornate, or you can get the slightly more simple style ones. When you go into the jewellers for gold, they don't have prices on it because it's sold by weight. So, you know, if you wanted to trade your gold, they would weigh it and tell you how much it's worth. And it goes by the currency of the day. The other thing you'll find is all these shopkeepers know each other. And I've been shopping here and maybe coming to this shop, not found the right materials, gone down to another shop further down. And the same woman's come, run up the road and met me there. So, you know, they all ring each other. They all know each other and they all price in the same category. You can pick up things like, you know, um, costume jewellery. Um, bindis, which I use in my artworks, um, henna, and they come in these tubes now so you get a fine point on the end so you can do quite intricate designs as well. And then obviously all the bangles and it's a good place to come for costume jewellery, especially if you're going to make something sculptural. And all, all the clothing is ready made here. In the olden days, uh, when we were small, um, my mum used to buy the fabric and then sew at home, or she'd have a seamstress, she'd go to just with our measurements and they'd, they'd make up our Indian uh, clothing. This is the last stop, Trinity Road. Um, famous for myself, because this is where I was born. So we used to live on one of the houses down here. My parents, when they migrated, my dad worked um, at a factory and he had one room rented in a house. And then he got married to my mum in 1967 and they had two rooms once my sister and I were born. Um, and as the story goes, it started to get a bit rough around here. So when my mum used to put her baby laundry out on, a, on the washing line, it started to get stolen. And we even had an intruder in the house. So my mum decided with my dad that we'd move out of Southall. And we lived in Hayes until I left to go to uni. So that's how all of this informs my practice. So I took a series of photographs. I will sort through them quite quickly. These are unedited and some of them uncropped. So kind of in the selection process of which are my favorites. But I like to kind of elucidate a narrative. I tried to be very candid um, and quite soft with my approach with the camera. I don't like the camera being too present, especially in the spaces we were in, so I was trying to find kind of patterns and shapes that I was drawn to, very much enjoying all the kind of textures and the softness, especially sitting on the floor with other people that kind of brought that kind of homely, almost nostalgic feel that I kind of bring to my photography. I like on this one that, I don't know if I intended to do that, probably not, but it's focused on the bus in the background instead, again, suggesting a kind of journey and a busyness that definitely felt when we were walking about, everyone kind of had their own things they were getting on with, which is always exciting. You always think, like, there's a whole theory about it, but um, the idea that literally everyone in their own brain is always thinking about what they're doing, what they're doing next, and it's kind of almost overwhelming to think it sounds silly when you say it out loud, but everyone has their own thoughts and their own actions just as complex as you do. Like this one again, how tidy her plait is and the bus, it's all kind of contextualised in, in London and where we are. Actually, this one might be my favourite. Um, yeah, I just really like this one, really uh, sweet and tender. I definitely felt that kind of 
aura of togetherness, especially as, you know, I wasn't fully in tune with, obviously, the prayer and what, because of, obviously, language barrier as well. It's like, it was, I think it was, yeah, a very a sensitive thing to do in terms of, obviously, photographing people because this is quite a vulnerable state like this to me is quite a vulnerable photo like she wherever she is inside like her thoughts is quite like a special and sensitive place so I wanted to be a bit more subtle with how I captured that I've made some models with clay and I've used turmeric and I started looking at the forms of some of the roof roofs that I saw around London there's the Indian influence. And then I started seeing how it was similar to a fig. So, and then figs come from India. And as I just basically just kept making the same kind of form over and over again for a couple of hours. And it started to sort of change. And because gold is a auspicious color in India, I was drawn to this fabric because I just thought it's so versatile you could make it look like metal if you used it in the right way so I've just been experimenting with it a bit so far but I was using just an umbrella and dismantling the umbrella because it's like a British like cold weather <laughs> item that keeps people sheltered and covering it with the warmth of the gold um, and kind of enriching it really um, and, and I'd like to carry on change, changing the shape of this metal frame. So it's basically a frame I can do things with and make it feel a bit tent-like. I originally was wanting to make it a bit like an arch because we saw a lot of the arches when we were out in the Indian architecture. So if I, if I was going to develop this further, I was thinking about um, combining the gold fabric with some denim. So the denim represents the western side of the Brick Lane area we were looking at, and I found some denim which was printed with a paisley pattern. So the paisley originates from China and India, and so I thought it was like the perfect combination of the, the east and the west, the paisley on the denim, and then with the gold. So these are just things that I've been experimenting with so far. In uh, Soho, uh, Soho, like uh, I was really inspired and uh, attracted to the market stalls and how the fabrics um, uh, how the fabrics are going one after another so sometimes they're going like in complete abstraction and so um, I was uh, also really inspired by uh, that pattern and that you're going like through them and it's like actually it's like an infinitive like portal to me in some kind so in the past I know like uh, there are many religions in India um, but after listening to the workshop uh, at that day, I just realized that how important role the religion plays in uh, Indians' uh, normal lives. Uh, this is the work I did uh, for about uh, the image of God. Uh, I'm very um, so for this time for this work, I'm more focused on the uh, the skills and the uh, the texture about how ma how to making the image of God. Uh, as you can see, I use the color. The color I use is brown. Uh, 